evening. Congratulations on resisting watching the Astros tonight and coming here instead. I would be lying if I said that I didn't watch a little bit of the beginning of the game. But it's good for all of us to be here together tonight. So for those who are here for the first, for the first time or those who may be watching on the video as well, what is, what is this series all about? Well, it's about hearing the gospel perhaps for the first time or hearing it in a new way. And the purposes are to enrich the mind and heart through prayer so that we can think like Christians. That was, that's what part of this is about, is to think with the Christian imagination. Also to be better equipped to tell the story of salvation, the story of the gospel to others. And then finally, that our hearts may be set aflame with the power of the gospel. And so that's what this series is all about. Last week, we talked about Genesis and God's grandeur. We looked into the mystery of the reality that we were created in God's image, and we also talked about what all the implications were about that, about the dignity of the human person and God's plan to divinize us, right? Uh, To, as his image, to be transformed and to be with him. And all of that taking place within this massive cosmos where God does not count the miles or the light years, but he counts the souls and he counts you, and he remembers you, and you are constantly on his mind. And that's what we spoke about last week. Um, So today, so what we were talking about was how we were created. Remember, if we talked about what Father Ricardo said, that we were created, that we were captured, rescued, and then it is time for us to respond. Well, we've been talking about the created, and today we will talk about being captured. And so that's what we will reflect on this evening. And before I uh, continue on, we, we do take quite a bit of, this, of these different reflections from Father Ricardo's book called Rescued. And there may be some copies left over. Um, are there any? Oh, no, there's none. So that's it. No more copies left. Uh, but the name of the book is called Rescued by Father Ricardo. And uh, these reflections that I am offering um, every Wednesday are based on his book and some of it are some of the subject matter and some of the, uh, the very things that I say are drawn from his book directly and other parts are inspired by his themes. So I would encourage anyone who hasn't read the book yet uh, to, or if you don't have it yet, to acquire it and read it. It's a very good read and it's, it's an easy read by design. Uh, and so I think that's a, that would be a really good thing for, for everyone to do if they have the time to do it. So before we dive into how we have been captured, let's turn to our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament and begin in prayer. You're invited to kneel if you want. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. To you, O Lord, we give thanks and praise for the glory of this evening. We thank you for the grace of salvation that you have given to us by the shedding of your blood on the cross. We ask you, O Lord Jesus, to send forth by your breath the Holy Spirit upon us with an an abundance of wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and good counsel. And let us have a deeper sense of appreciation of the salvation that is offered to us by having a greater sense of the great danger of eternal condemnation so that we may not be tempted to despair, but may enter into the glory and the praise that is yours in eternal life. We ask this in your most holy name. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. So today is going to be a hard session because we're going to look at the bad news, right? And because this is a session that is drawn out over many weeks, we're not going to talk a whole lot about the good news this evening. I trust that you already know what the good news is, right? It's Jesus. Okay. We're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about the bad news, and Father Ricardo calls it horrific news. As I said earlier, it's the news of our capture. And this news this evening is meant to 
give us a sense of horror. But even in the book, Father Ricardo says that we can even ask for the gift of despair. Now, it doesn't literally mean for us to despair, but rather to have a sense of the very stuff that would bring us into despair. And that's the reality of how we have been captured, how we had been captured. But we must always remember hope. And that also one other thing that's very important. And this is a challenge for the preacher. Because the preacher, the priest, wants to preach the fullness of the truth to the people, right? But sometimes we kind of shy away from talking about how we have been captured, and that is by the devil. We want to shy away from talking about hell and eternal condemnation because it is such a tough topic. But the problem with that, of, of holding back and preaching about it and letting people know about it, is that God himself revealed it, Right? It's all part of revelation. God himself revealed the reality of the devil, of eternal condemnation, of of hell, of the danger of condemnation. And so that's why it's so important for us to go through this tonight. And so what this means is that the Lord wants us to open up our minds and our hearts to his grace as it is revealed in the bad news that is part of the good news. That's part of the good news. One insight from Father Ricardo, he says that the scriptures, that the scripture is like game film. So as we go through the sacred scriptures tonight, a lot of it is going to be coming from Genesis, which is all written in the past tense as a story that happened in the past. But Father Ricardo makes the really brilliant point that scriptures don't just tell us about what happened, but also tells us what is happening, what actually happens to us, because we have all been created in God's image, just like Adam and Eve, and we all have entered into this life in the state of original sin as their descendants. So we're all subject to these same kinds of tactics, these same kinds of temptations, these same kinds of struggles. So following through, uh, following quite a bit from Father Ricardo's book, we're going to look into and expand upon the following aspects of how we have been captured. That is, the following aspects about how we have been captured by the devil. The first is that we'll talk about the identity of the devil. Who is the devil? What is he? We're going to talk about his reason for rebelling. We'll talk about what his different names are. What, are, what is his root strategy? We'll talk about his tactics and then will reflect very briefly on his goal for our lives. This also answers the question, if you remember those fundamental questions that Father Ricardo goes into, right? Why is there something rather than nothing? Why is everything messed up? What has God done if he has done anything about it? And how am I to respond? And tonight we begin to answer the question, why is it all messed up, right? What's the deal with sin and its consequences? As sort of a preface to to my remarks, I want to also uh, highlight something that would be very important for us to understand, because probably what I'm about to say you've heard before. Recent theologians of the past 100 years, influenced by the sciences, have denied the reality that the devil is real. Have you ever heard that before, where some say the devil isn't real, right? Uh, They say that, for example, demonic manifestations that seem to be demonic, they actually find their root in prosaic regular, natural explanations. They would say that there would be psychological manifestations in these cases of exorcism, or when one is struggling with obsessive thinking, that they're all psychological manifestations. And even though that might be true to, certain, to a certain extent, psychological manifestations cannot lead a person to levitate, to climb up walls, to throw men around the room, even if they're twice their size, or to speak ancient languages. None of those will you find in the manuals of the psychological sciences, right? It's just completely irrational. Also, the idea of the demonic, there's this other idea that the idea of the demonic developed in the ancient world under the influence of pagan religions. And so they say that Jesus himself speaks of the devil only as a way of adapting to the culture of the time. And so the devil really is just a personification of evil, and Jesus speaks about the devil 
to adapt himself to the culture of the time. Now, I propose to you that this is absurd. And the reason is because that adaptation would have been a deception. It would not have been revelatory. It wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been revelation. That there is no devil, I don't know about you, but I think that's a pretty important point to get right. And Jesus didn't just make it up or adapt himself. He left absolutely no hint that the devil was not real. And all of scriptural tradition, all of scriptural tradition shows that the devil is real, that he is a real person. And we're about to go into now who is and what is this person. Father Ricardo begins by quoting the catechism to talk about who and what Satan is. The church teaches that Satan was at first a good angel made by God, originally good. The devil and the other demons were indeed created naturally good by God, but they became evil by their own doing. So to put it simply, the devil and the demons, we talk about demons, what are demons? Well, they were angels. They were originally created in God's light and in God's um, beatitude, and they had a decision to make. Were they going to do his will or not? And the devil, originally his name was Lucifer, rebelled against God. Rather, he chose himself and chose to do his own will rather than that of God, that of the Lord's. And he and the other angels who were created in that original beatitude and, the other, and these other angels following the devil in his decision, inspired by his example, fell from the heavens. They are also called fallen angels. So that's what demons are. Huh? Looking more into the identity, the sacred scriptures tell us uh, different aspects about this, this devil that we, that we understand to be real. For example, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, Genesis refers to him as the serpent. And we'll, we're going to read a little bit about that, or we'll reflect on that scripture passage for our Alexio today. He is called the serpent, the most cunning of all the wild creatures, it says in Genesis the most intelligent, the most powerful. And yet at the same time, what Genesis is teaching us is that the devil is a creature, right? He's not more powerful than God. There was a, an ancient sort of a mythic belief or even a, a heresy, we could say, during a time of St. Augustine called Manichaeism. And Manichaeism understood that in the cosmos, we have two supreme beings, and two supreme beings, one is good and the other one is evil. And through all eternity, they battle against each other. And we don't believe that, right? We don't believe that there is a balance between good and evil. How many of you watch Star Wars? Any Star Wars fans here? Yeah, about the, good, the dark side and the, and the light side, right? The good side and the dark side of the force, the light and the dark. Um, that is big-time Manichaeism, right? Don't get me wrong, I love Star Wars and the Jedi and all that, right? And, and it used to be, uh, George Lucas was saying that the light is stronger than the darkness. Now they've morphed into this thing where they're both kind of the same and then they're trying to integrate them to, you know, it's just craziness. I still like Star Wars. <laughs> but we don't believe that when it comes to the devil. He is a creature. He is not more powerful than God. God is infinitely more powerful than any power including the devil. In John chapter 12, verse 31, Jesus says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the ruler of this world be cast out. Who is he referring to? He's not referring to any earthly king. He's referring to the devil. So the devil is identified as the ruler of this world, this fallen world. And yet at the same time, in another part of John, it says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? Well, what's going on there? Well, there's two ways that the, word, that the word world is used. There is the fallen world, and then there is the world that the Lord wants to save, right? There is that part of the world that is subject to Satan, that is on its way towards eternal condemnation, 
and then there is the world of his people. So there's two understandings. Just like with the word flesh, the word, the word flesh that St. Paul uses when he talks about the flesh that wages against the spirit, wages war against the spirit. Have you heard of that, right? The spirit and the flesh? Well, he's talking about that part of us that is fallen, the flesh that is fallen, not the body itself. The body is good, but that part of us that is fallen is called the flesh. So it's the same thing with regard to the use of the word world. So Satan is the ruler of this fallen world. Paul also talks about him in Ephesians chapter 2 as the prince of the power of the air. Now there's some interesting uh, physics going on there, right? Now they had a, an understanding of the cosmos that was, that was different from ours, a bit, a bit unique, that understood that there were powers in the air and under the earth, that there were powers within fire and within water, that there were spirits and all of these different elements. And some of the uh, some of the old, the, some of the blessings in the old rite actually speaks about expelling spirits from these different elements. So it's really sort of fascinating. But anyway, that's an identity that we hear about as well, that he's the prince of the power of the air. Peter, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, calls the devil a roaring lion, that the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. The first letter of John, chapter 5, he's called the evil one, and saying the whole world is in the power of the evil one. And then in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, it talks about him, and it calls him the great dragon. Now, as it turns out, the word that is used for serpent in Genesis is also the word that is also, can also be translated into dragon. So when Revelation refers to dragon, it can also very well be borrowing language from Genesis, using the language of Genesis and as talking about the dragon. It talks about the dragon that was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. The deceiver of the whole world. That means the whole world suffers as a result of the devil's deception. It also says, and, and this is something, this is a, a side point that I want to make that I think is interesting, but I've heard this from some scholars and uh, as well as some priests who are exorcists, where they, where they talk about that part where it says that the, that the great dragon with his tail swept a third of the stars from the sky. That's in, that, that's in Revelation as well. And the stars from the sky, many scripture uh, scholars interpret that to mean that the angelic beings, the angelic hosts, right? A lot of times stars and angelic hosts, those images were used almost simultaneously. But what would that mean? That would, that would mean that, that the devil swept down a third of the angels with him by his influence, by his scandal, by his evil example. Now, what that actually means, if you do the math right, how many thirds are there in a, in a whole? Well, there's three of them. So you have one third, then that means that two thirds of the angels remain faithful. So if I get my math correct, that means that there are twice as many good angels as there are fallen angels. Thanks be to God for that, right? Now, if you think about it also, there are some who say that there may be billions of angels. They may number in the billions. St. Thomas Aquinas would say on the order of nature, angels are more excellent, more beautiful, more powerful than human beings are in the order of nature. And so it is part of God's nature to create more of that which is more excellent and beautiful. Now there are billions of people, billions of people over history, we could imagine there would be billions more of the angels and also billions of demons. So we must remember that the devil is a powerful creature far more powerful and intelligent than we are. And that's because, going a little bit into the, into the reality of angels, they are pure intellect and pure will. They are not, in a way, I don't want to, I hate to use this kind of language, but weighed down by matter, right? I, I hate to say that because matter is good. I don't want to get the impression that matter is bad, that the stuff we're made of is bad. But rather, when it comes to the use of the intellect, we need to use these machines called brains. And we have to, in order for us to learn things, we have to see something, we have to think about it, and then we'll get it, right? 
or we need a teacher to go up on a chalkboard and explain to us how to do algebra and calculus and, and the structure of the solar system and how to write a sentence and diagram and grammar and all of that stuff. And then, we might, and then hopefully we'll get it and make an A on the exam. The angels are not like that. They grasp things immediately without having to go through a thought process. That's how intelligent they are. In fact, St. Thomas Aquinas would say that the angels pretty much God downloaded information into their spiritual minds at the moment of their creation, so much more than we could comprehend in a lifetime. That's just, that's just their intellect. We're not even talking about their power. For them to move matter, and I'll go into this in a little bit, it'll be relevant later on to understand, but for them to move matter, to move a rock, a car, a building, a planet, it's, it's effortless for them. They're not, they're not breaking a sweat because they can't sweat, right? That's, that's, that's the, the reality of these incredible creatures. But unfortunately, some of them are fallen, right? That's the unfortunate part. But we have to remember, of course, that the devil, the demons, they're just, they're just creatures. Huh? We have to remember that. What are the devil's names? We looked into his identity, but he also has some specific names. And it's important to understand these names because names mean something. They're tied to one's mission. So as I mentioned already, the one that we call the devil was called Lucifer in his original creation, in his, uh, in his origin, which meant light bearer. There are some that theorize that he was a seraphim angel, which would have been the highest of the order of the angels. Others say, well, he actually was a cherubim, the second order. I don't really understand all the arguments behind it, but those are just some theories, right? But that he was a very powerful and beautiful angel. But when he fell, he, his mission, which changed his name, we could say, was to be the accuser. And another word for accuser, or the name that means that, that comes from the word accuser, is Satan. Satan. He's also called the devil, which means divider, right? The divider. There are also other names of other demons as well that we have come to know. Baal is one of them. Have you heard of Baal? Like in the Old, Old Testament, uh, a god that, to, to which people would offer sacrifices uh, through uh, sexual orgies and all kinds of uh, unspeakable acts. Uh, Baphomet is another one. Uh, he is a demon that is very instrumental in child sacrifice. Some of the um, exorcists say that he is very much one of the highest generals in the demonic order that is responsible for the ongoing persecution and the ongoing advancement of abortion all throughout the world. It's, why is that? It's because it's like child sacrifice, sacrificing to, for all kinds of reasons. And, and you, you also may have heard me say that there is a demonic order. And one, one interesting truth about the demons is that they like to ape what the angels do, right? So there is an order among the angels. There's also an order among the demons. And we, we might find that a bit curious to think, well, how could, if, if, if the devil is the divider and there's division among, among the, the demons and the demons are just unspeakably evil, how could they unite for a common purpose? Well, the reality is that they're not 100% pure evil because 100% pure evil basically would be nothing, right? They are sustained in existence. Existence itself is good. And so they're not 100% entirely evil. They actually retain some of their, they, they retain their nature. So they're, like I said, their intelligence and their power, they, they've retained that. Also their ability to work together and to collaborate. Remember what Jesus said when he was being accused of expelling demons by the power of Beelzebub. Remember that? And what did Jesus say in response? He said, well, the devil isn't real. I'm just kidding. He didn't say that. <laughs> no. What did he say? He said, if, if the devil is fighting against his own kingdom, how could his kingdom stand, right? If I am expelling by the power of Beelzebul, then that means that Beelzebul is fighting against himself. What he's saying is that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> doesn't make any logical sense. But there is that order by which they work. 
What's the reason? What's the reason for rebelling? This is a real mystery because Lucifer was created in original goodness and happiness. Uh, He was happy at the instant of his creation, right? It's a real mystery why he would have decided to disobey. What we do know, however, what we do know, however, according to Aquinas, is that the first sin of Lucifer and that of all the, all the fallen angels was pride. The first sin was pride. And pride is a decision to not to be subject to a superior when subjection is due, right? It's a decision to not be subject to a superior when subjection is due. That's the general definition of pride that Aquinas gives. But it didn't stop with pride. It also continued with envy. Wisdom chapter 2 verse 24 says, Through the devil's envy, death entered the world, and those who belong to his party experience it. So Aquinas says that after the sin of pride... There followed the evil of envy in the sinning angel. That means the devil and all the, all the demons, right? Whereby the devil grieved over man's good and also over the divine excellence. That means the divine will. According as against the devil's will, God makes use of man for the divine glory. That he makes use of the human being that, he, that God may be glorified in heaven. We were created to glorify him, and that irked the devil in his envy. They envied the place that human beings would play in the exaltation of God's glory. Now, St. Thomas Aquinas talks about how there is a debate about what was revealed at the moment of the angel's creation. And by the way, it wasn't like their fall wasn't like it was for us, like for Adam and Eve. They were created. They were given all the fruits of the tree in the Garden of Eden. They enjoyed it for some time. They probably walked around and had a mango here and there. You know, I don't know, whatever kind of fruit was there. And then at some point, they encountered the serpent. But for the angels, the theologians say, they were actually given all of this information, all of this enlightenment and wisdom and knowledge of what God's plan was for all of the creation of the material universe and also the creation of human beings. And they also, also God communicated to them what their role would be in the life of the universe and in the lives of these human beings. And so at that instant, that's when they had a decision to make, right? Am I, am I down with this plan that God's telling me? Am I also, am I also all, am I gonna go gung-ho for what God wants me to do for whatever assignment I'm supposed to have? For example, your guardian angels, right? At the moment, at the instant of their creation, they were told, you're going to go be Stacy's guardian angel, right? Or Rachel's guardian angel, right? Yes, the angel said. Absolutely, let's do it. Sounds good to me. Glory, glory to you, O Lord. The debate, however, is about, did God plan to become one of us in the beginning, before human beings were even created, before there was even sin, did the Son of God want to become one of us? Did he want to become incarnate? Was he going to join with our human nature? And if that is the case, if the answer is yes, then the devil and and the angels, the fallen angels, would have in their pride rejected the plan because they would not want to bow down and worship the man-God. That God would assume an inferior nature to them would outrage the pride of the demons. Something interesting to think about. There's no dogmatic proclamation on it, but I think it's something interesting to think about. But in any case... God was showing that these creatures that are inferior to you are going to give glory to me, and you're going to serve them, right? Another, I heard from another exorcist, I think this was Father Ripperger, who's um, actually an exorcist that works in Denver, 
when he said that as he was doing a certain exorcism, sometimes an exorcist can command a demon to speak the truth, to say the truth about whatever it is that the, that the exorcist is demanding that the demon say. And in one of these exchanges, a demon revealed to Father Ripperger that the devil also envied the Blessed Virgin Mary, the most beautiful and exalted above all angels and saints. She's called the Queen of Angels, right? She's exalted even above the angels. And that the devil envies the Blessed Mother because of her incredible beauty. Beauty that he doesn't possess, and even his own beauty he lost as a result of his disobedience. Okay, so those are the reasons, what went into some of the reasons for his rebellion. What, so again, I, I like, and I like to think of it this way before I continue on. Why did the devil rebel? Why did he refuse God in that original happiness? We can ask the same, thing, the same question about Adam and Eve, but at least with Adam and Eve, we can say, well, they were tempted. But there was, there was no outside force or another beings making suggestions to the devil or to the, to the other fallen angels to say, did God really mean what he said, right? No, just on their own, they made this decision. That's one of the reasons some theologians say why they don't get the benefit of mercy. They, God was never merciful to the angels because they had absolutely no excuse. Whereas God had more mercy on, on human beings because of the influence of the devil and because they're just not as bright as angels. <laughs> it's interesting. But going back to that question, why would he do it? It doesn't make sense. And maybe that's the point. Evil doesn't make sense. Rejection of God's will ultimately is illogical, unreasonable. So what are the enemy's root strategies and tactics? Well, Father Ricardo points out that one of his root strategies is that he tries to convince us to deceive us, right? The deceiver of the whole world, as we heard in Revelation. He tries to convince us that God is not a good father, but instead he is our adversary. We're going to read in Lexio, where the devil says to the woman, did God really say you shall not eat of any of the trees of the garden? Now, what did God actually tell Adam and Eve? He said, you can, have, you can partake of any of the fruit of the trees in the garden just cannot eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? But here comes the devil. He says, did he really say that you can't eat any of the fruit? What's well, part of the deception is to, is to make one think that obedience to God is onerous, right? It's onerous. It's kind of like if you tell a young child that you can't, you can't stay out past 9 o'clock, you can't play video games until you've done your homework, you can't do this, you can't do that, and what do they sometimes say? I can't do anything. <laughs> well, no, you can. You can play games after you do your homework, right? No, I can't do anything. It's the same thing with the, with the evil one, what he's trying to convince Adam and Eve, or at least here in the conversation with Eve. Did he really say you can't eat any of the tree, any of the fruits of the tree of the garden? But the serpent said to the woman also, when the, when, when the woman says, no, he didn't say that, he actually said that we shouldn't, even we should we can eat of any of the fruit of the trees in the garden of eden but we should not even touch the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or we will die and the serpent said to the woman you will not die you will not die for god knows and he's keeping it secret god knows that when you eat of it your eyes will be opened and you'll be like god knowing good and evil. Now, I'm going to get ahead of myself here in the story, but I'm assuming that most here are, are, all of you here are familiar with the story of Genesis. But what happens when they actually eat the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? When they eat it, it says their eyes were opened, and then they saw that they were naked, right? So the devil wasn't telling a complete lie, just enough of the truth with a twist that ends up being spiritually fatal, right? And that's how he plays on the mind of the human being. Just enough truth that it makes some sense, but with a twist in order to deceive. 
Father Ricardo makes the point that when God is telling us that to eat something, it means to have mastery over it. That's what the, that's what the poetic sense is in, in the book of Genesis, right? In that part of the story, it means to have mastery over it. And if God's creatures eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it means that they are appropriating for themselves the right to determine what is good and what is evil, right? So the devil is really saying, if you try to be like God, you're not going to die. You're going to be like him. You're going to be able to determine good and evil. You're going to be able to know the difference between good and evil, not the difference between good and evil, but to know good and evil, to determine it. To put it another way, if you know good and evil, you know everything, right? So God is really saying to them, it's not for you to know everything. But the devil says, yeah, it is. And God knows it, right? No, the reality is that it is for God alone. And the irony of this, the sad irony, is that God wanted and wants to share with us his power and his goodness. Remember what we said in the beginning, that his will was to divinize us, right? To make us one with him in his power and his goodness and eternal delight. But instead, in this place of sin and death, we despair of God's goodness. Maybe he isn't as good as I thought in the beginning. Maybe he isn't as good as he said he was. And so how do we respond? We grasp after power. We try to take goodness for ourselves. We try to steal goodness when goodness is being freely given, right? So what are some of the tactics that the devil uses in order to get us to despair of God's goodness and to grasp after power? Well, Father Ricardo says that the first thing that we can say is that Satan accuses, right? Obviously, that's what his name means. It means adversary. He accuses, he points out, he mocks the sins of others. The trick is to get you to sin by making sin look good, and even to get you to feel like you are entitled to it. And then when when he is trying to tempt you to go into it, you sin, and then he says, aha, see? Look at you. You should be ashamed of what you just did. He'll make sin appear evil. I mean, excuse me, he'll make sin appear good. And then when you commit sin, he'll show you how evil it is, right? To flip it on to you, make you feel despair. He also lies. He's called the father of lies, right? The deceiver. He is called the divider. I already said that already, right? He divides communities, he divides families. He also flatters, right? He likes to flatter, puffing up pride in order to lead the person to sin. And of course, he tempts by leading into sin, like I said already, by showing us how good sin is. And he also discourages. He discourages. There's two ways I would say that the evil one discourages. I'm kind of drawing from St. Ignatius of Loyola. The devil will first discourage us by making us think that we are just too bad to ever be good, right? We're just too bad to ever be good, to ever be forgiven. God will never forgive me of my sins. And also, he will try to discourage us so that when we actually commit the sin, to actually tell us that it wasn't as bad as you thought, right? It's not as bad as you thought. You're okay to discourage from repentance. And going back to the flattery as well, while I'm thinking about it, does he not also make us think that we are so good that we can never do bad? Is that not another deception? Anyway. Now, here's here's an interesting track that we can take with St. Thomas Aquinas by asking the question, How exactly does the devil and his minions do all of these things? How does he do all of these things? Right? Does he he whisper? Does he... How do they do it? Well, we can go back to what St. Thomas Aquinas talks about with regard to what angels can do. And what angels can do, naturally speaking, is that they can actually move corporal things. I talked about it already. I remember hearing a story of how someone was in the car with her husband... And they were driving down the road. 
Her husband wasn't paying attention. He was looking off to the left, and there was a big pile of rocks that they were about to crash into. And at the instant that, that the woman saw that they were about to crash into the pile of rocks, she instantly called out to her angel. And at that moment, the car lifted right up off the ground, went over the pile of rocks, and went down onto the road, and they just continued on their way, right? The angels can do that. But they can also do this, as St. Thomas Aquinas says, they can also do this uh, on people as well. They can have this kind of effect. Now, something that's very important to say at the very beginning is that neither angels nor demons can directly influence the will. They can't touch your will. That's, that remains immaculate. That remains untouched. Only God can actually change your will, and he doesn't do it. He doesn't do it. He doesn't actually touch the will. He allows us to make decisions freely. However, the angels and the demons can influence the will directly. And they can do this through moving the imagination. Now, where is Aquinas getting all of this, that angels and demons can do this and that? Well, he's drawing it from Scripture. If you look all throughout his Summa, like the, the vast majority of it is just drawing from the sacred Scriptures, examples from the Scriptures. And he's drawing from where the angels reveal divine truth and also commands through dreams, such as in... Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, right? What happened there? Joseph was dreaming, and the angel spoke to him in a dream and warned him about Herod and how he was going after all of the babies in the area, right? That they were seeking to kill their child. That was warning Joseph. How does an angel do that? Well, again, they can, they can move corporal beings, so they can move the imagination, right? If we understand the imagination and how it works, we know that, it, that we have these neurons and these brains, right, that are constantly firing, and we know that, that our imagination, how we see things, how we're able to see things with our eyes and also with our mind, it's connected to our brain. And so in some kind of unsettling way, angels can touch that stuff. I don't know about you, but I think that's unsettling, but... <laughs> The angels help. They also help. It's like, all right, fine. Do what you need to do. Right? Move the imagination. Help me out here. St. Thomas Aquinas also says that they can move the passions, move the emotions, the hormones within us. You know, lead us to feel certain things. And of course, they can move parts of the body in the most extreme sense, in the most extreme cases. He also says that the angels can affect the senses that they can do this from the outside. So they can affect the imagination, but they, also, uh, they can also affect the external senses. So Genesis chapter 19, verse 11, there's a story of Sodom and Gomorrah, where the citizens of Sodom were going to try to break in to the house of Lot in order to attack him and his children. But the angels appeared, it said, and he struck those assailants with blindness, so that they could not even find the door, right? They can also do this from the outside by assuming some kind of a body, like an apparition, like the three angels that appeared in, in human form to Abraham and Sarah. Or, of course, they can also do this from within by manipulating the body itself. I like to think that the angel Gabriel, when he appeared to the Blessed Virgin Mary, did so externally. I don't know why, but I, I just like to imagine like that. Maybe because that's how it's painted, so that's how it happened, right? Now, there are levels of activity by which a demon can influence us by varying levels that get more and more intense and disturbing. The first level that a de by which a demon can uh, influence us is just simply by influence by moving the imagination in subtle ways, in subtle whispers. See, something to remember is that the devil gains more pleasure in his shame, pleasure in his shame, by getting you to freely choose to sin than by forcing you to do something, right? Just, we can always keep that in mind as we go through this. So a, a, an example in the sacred scriptures of the devil influencing somebody would be our first Pope, Peter, right? There was that part where Jesus said that the Son of Man must be handed over and, and to be crucified and then on the third day be raised. And what does Peter do? He goes up to Jesus and he says, God forbid that should even happen to you. What does Jesus say in response? Get behind me, Satan. 
get behind me, Satan. That's probably the worst thing that you'd want to hear Jesus tell you, right? Of all the things, and this is our first pope. Thanks be to God we have examples like that, though, of one who can be redeemed and glorified. So that could be an, that could be an example of one who was influenced subtly. Then the next level is oppression and obsession, where one can experience obsessive thoughts and behaviors where the whole personality can be distorted or enslaved to irrational impulses or dark moods, uncontrollable anger, compulsive lying. It could also be something happening internally. We, hear, we see that in Acts chapter 5, verse 3. There was this uh, man in Acts called, his name was Ananias, who was acting deceptively. And Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? We can also consider Judas. Uh, that it says that at the moment, at the Last Supper, that Satan entered into him, and then that he left in order to betray his friend Jesus. And then the final order of, in, of influence and attack is possession, full-on possession. This is where a demon or multiple demons, one or two or perhaps as many as a thousand, can enter the body and control every aspect of it, with the exception of, of course, the will. The will remains intact, but the person may have no control over anything else. So I don't want to go more into details about that so I can just finish up here. But what is Satan's goal in all of this? Satan's goal for your life and mine is destruction. So we're involved in a reality where there's no neutral territory. We are either in the hands of God or we are in the hands of the devil. The eternal consequence, the reality is that the eternal consequence of grave sin is eternal destruction in hell. Where Jesus may say to us, depart from me, you curse, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. That's Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Death and sin are not just things, they are powers. Powers that were created through the influence of the devil in this world to defeat us, to destroy us. Romans chapter 5 talks about death reigning as if it was a king. Romans chapter 3 talks about us being under the power of sin. Death and sin are powers leveraged by the devil in order to destroy us. The good news is this, the grace of God sets us free from these powers. Huh? The grace of God sets us free from these powers. Freedom, true freedom is what we want. Now, unfortunately, and I'll talk about this next week, the world does not see Christianity as freeing, right? But rather as restrictive, right? Did the Lord really tell you you can't do anything? That's what the world says about Christianity. But the reality, as Father Ricardo puts it, is like this, and he's quoting Fleming Rutledge. He says, No one is capable of being captain of his own soul, master of her own fate. Each of us is worked upon by unconscious impulses of which we are not even aware and over which we have little control. Paul, unlike the typical American does not think in terms of autonomous human beings. No one is, quote-unquote, free in the domain of this world as it is. Either we must live our lives in the clutches of soul-destroying powers, or we are delivered into the obedience of faith. The obedience of faith sets us free from enslavement to the devil. I'll go ahead and open up now to any questions you might have. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, uh, the microphone's coming up, sorry. Thank you very much. Father, I just want to thank you for another wonderful presentation. And, you know, you, you mentioned uh, Father Chad Ripperger. Mm -hmm. I just want to say that he's going to be uh, speaking at St. Teresa's in Sugarland. On uh, Saturday, October 21st, he's giving three talks. And the third talk is on the sanctity of the priesthood. So just in case anyone's interested in that, that's Great. coming up.
Uh, 12.30 is the first talk, 1.45 is the second talk, and 3 o'clock is the third talk. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for mentioning that. At St. Teresa's in Sugarland, correct? Yeah. Any more questions? We have a question here. Thanks. Earlier you mentioned something about abortion and how it has this country in a clutch from the influence of bail, is that what you no, said? A bath on that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and a lot of, I guess, counter arguments people like to make when it comes to something as horrible as that is, oh, what if it was rape or incest, mm -hmm. given that um, that, mm -hmm. that almost never happens, you know, in comparison to when, oh, well, I'll just do it. What can be said when it comes to, um, I guess, arguing against mm. it in that case? Yes, you're talking about, the, so in the case of rape and incest, what, what would be the, uh, if somebody were to say, well, what about in those cases, wouldn't abortion, should, shouldn't that be allowable or shouldn't that be okay in that case? Is that well, the question? Well, not necessarily. Mm. I mean, I don't really know how to ask this question without huh? sounding insensitive on either one end because I've talked to people um, and uh, been called kind of, <laughs> I mean, insensitive about, uh, you know, what I think about it. But, I mean, what can be said when it comes to fighting for life in no, that fighting point? Fighting for life. Like in those cases, you're, you mean? Is that where, yeah? Yes. Yes. Um, well, I think, of course, first and foremost, you know, what, what, what are the tools of the devil, right, and in, in how he leverages this? It's in, it's in deception and in hatred, right? And so we respond by love and truth always and, every, and everywhere as Christians. Um, so, of course, in, in the cases of uh, rape and incest, which are just, uh, I, mean, I mean, horrific circumstances, and I, I cannot personally possibly imagine what one would be going through in those cases, where a, a young woman or young girl have been impregnated in those kind of circumstances. So how do we respond? Well, always, of course, with love and understanding uh, towards them and, and try to accompany them, be with them, support them, right? And also to let them know what the truth is, uh, that you have a, a glorious human being, child in, inside of you that is growing, that God has allowed and even breathed in life into um, and that this is, this is God's gift to the world. And even though it may not seem like it, hey, I'm with you, I'm holding you, I, I want to help you out and, sled you, and help you see through it. And also the truth is that, uh, is, that, uh, is that getting an abortion makes things much, much worse for that young girl or for that young woman that may have been maybe experiencing that. Um, because ultimately in the end, we know, right? And, and mom, a mother knows what is happening. Yeah. And one other question regarding this, what can also be said about, you know, the unfortunate state of states like New York where they basically allow it to be partially, be basically in the world, not even connected to the womb at any point, and just cut it off, and it, along with other kinds of women. Um, horrible uh, circumstances when it comes to just, oh, I'm just going to do it. I mean, what can be said about that? You mean about the, the culture of what's happening there? Yes. Or, uh, yeah, that's, that's the devil run amok. I mean, honestly, that's, I mean, we're, you know, we've, we've, gone, we've gone from, as a society, the, the culture of abortion has gone from safe, legal, and rare, right? Which in itself, that doesn't make rational sense. It's because do we want to make, a, do we want to make heart surgery safe, legal, and rare? Well, no, we want to make sure they're safe, but why do they have to be rare, right? Why do we want, why do we want to make abortion rare? Either it's taking a human life or it's not, right? Um, so just logically thinking through it. But now it's gotten to the point where it is being celebrated and it is being exalted. Um, it really has become uh, a sacrament of evil in our country. And, um, and in, in some cases, even some satanic cults will use abortion 
as a kind of sacrament. I mean, it, they, they see it in that way uh, as a way of exalting the devil. Uh, it's just really ugly, uh, dark stuff. Um, and now, but now you see it far more open, even all the way up to the point of birth, like what you're talking about. Um, I mean, at least, at least um, one can claim ignorance when we're talking about abortion, like in the first eight weeks. One can claim ignorance. They don't know what, what they're looking at. They don't know the science behind it. It's just a clump of cells, like what they say. They don't see that it's a fully formed human being at the moment of conception. But at the moment of birth, you know, or after eight months, um, that it's even being allowed at that, at that moment. I mean, what, what, what else can one say, but it's just the devil run amok, you know? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your question. I was just wondering, uh, when you mentioned about the cults, what can we as, as humans, and what, can, what is the church doing to help um, overcome, I guess is the word, for some of the cults and religions that are blossoming here in the United States and probably in other countries, obviously, from the killings that we're seeing now, mm -hmm. that is all evil. Right, and right. so what can we do besides prayer? Or is that, I mean, that's a lot, but mm -hmm. is there anything that is happening specifically to fight this? Um, not, I would say, well, of course, first and foremost, you mentioned prayer already, right? Uh, there are prayers of reparation that one can make. Uh, prayers like, for example, the the divine praises those that was originally called prayer or act of reparation because it was making a, a reparation for all the blasphemies against against god and jesus christ and the blessed virgin mary and joseph um so making acts of reparation doing acts of penance because ultimately i mean we live we live in a free country right uh free and and more of the sense of autonomy and not free in terms of actual freedom and, and virtue um but what, what can we do for people that are kind of lost in that state, that state of mind, that state in which they're involved in satanic cults or any kind of uh, witchcraft, things that are, that are connected to, to Satan through the occult, through occult practices? What can we do except pray for their conversion, right? And also to educate and to protect ourselves as well. That's why I, I know that there has been, there's like two schools of thought on how to handle this when it comes to young people. Like, do you tell them not to play with Ouija boards or, or should you tell them not to play with them or you should tell them, or should you not say anything, right? Because if you say something, then the first thing they're gonna do is they're gonna go play with the Ouija board if you tell them not to do it, right? Um, I'm more, of, this, I'm more of, the, of the school of thought that Ouija boards are already out there, they're being sold at Walmart, sure, go ahead and tell them, you know tell them, educate them about, about these things. You know, I mean, at, at age-appropriate levels, of course, with prudence. Um, so I would say education, and the other, be, the other would be prayer. Um, and of course, the new evangelization. The reason why the occult uh, Satanism is blossoming, like what you were saying, is because of the vacuum of faith, especially in the public square. And when you have a lack of faith in the public square and in public life, the vacuum has to be filled with something else. And it may, I mean, I think what we're talking about with New York, right, what's happening, there's a vacuum that's filling up what used to be a, a place of faith. Uh, it's being replaced with something else. And I'm gonna talk about that next week when we talk about being captured by the world. Yeah. Um, being a new Catholic, I'm right yeah. here. Uh, I'm new to the idea of guardian angels. Could you speak to that a little bit? Um, like, how, they, how, how are they assigned? I mean, um, is it scripturally like, I don't know. It's just, it's a, it's a foreign notion to, mm. you know, Protestant faith, I think. And um, so I just, you know, I, I have a guardian angel. Am I supposed to talk to the angel? I, mean, I don't know. I don't know anything about it. But anyway, if you would just speak to that, I would be appreciative. Yeah. That's, um, yeah, there, there's a lot that can be said about it. There's, there's like books written about guardian angels and about angels in general uh, that, that I found they've been very good in the past. Uh, but there, there's a couple of things we can find. Well, first, in the sacred scriptures, Jesus uh, does talk about accepting children such as these, for I 
for I tell you their angels contemplate the face of the Father in heaven. So, you know, he's talking about how these children are being guarded by angels. And, there's just, and, and it's just also in the, in the tradition of the church that we all have guardian angels as well. And Aquinas talks about that as, as, uh, as well. And what we can do in our relationship with our guardian angels is, of course, to pray and ask for their help every day. And, and it's not that the angel's just going to sit back and kind of do nothing and wait for you to, to ask for help, right? Um, but it, does, it empowers them even more, right? Um, there's, there's something about, you know, praying, asking help from the saints, where, they, where they're already praying for us already, but asking for particular help, that it kind of unlocks graces, right? It kind of unlocks uh, the action of the angel where he can get even more involved or she can get more involved in your life. Not that angels are he or she's, but you get my point, yeah. Um, does that make sense? Or did I answer the question? Is there more than one? For each person, you mean? Yeah. How many do you want? <laughs> you can ask for them. Yeah, um, I've, heard, I've heard a couple of things. I actually looked into this question. Um, I've, I, I, I've heard that we all have at least one. I've also heard that a priest gets a second one to guard his priesthood. I've also heard that the Holy Father is, has St. Michael as his personal guardian. Um, so I've, I've heard multiple things, but I don't see why there couldn't be more than, an angel, more than one angel. But we do believe that everyone has at least one angel guarding them. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I actually just wanted to go back and, and make a comment to, I guess, your question. Um, from from just personal experience, um, when you're put in that situation of having to choose um, whether to have an abortion or to take the baby to term from situations that are from either incest or rape, I think it, um, obviously everybody is, is in their own situation, but for myself, I just know at that time when your family upbringing is already broken to begin with and you don't have the faith instilled in your family right off the bat you're already vulnerable to yeah. to satan coming in so those those actions of of rape or incest you know you don't understand um that it happened to you until it happens yeah and then you're alone and you can't turn to God and say, okay, now pray for me because that wasn't even part of your upbringing. So it's, it's hard to say, well, this is what you should do because of course nobody ever wishes to be in that situation. And of course, when you're young and your parents or someone in your family had done that to you, there really is no other safe haven. And so you end up doing what you think should be done um and then you of course live with with guilt and you live with all the the consequences but the thing at the end of the day is it it shouldn't lead you into despair because if you have a family that's already strong in the faith mm -hmm. and you already have all that love and you already know that god loves you mm -hmm. you wouldn't be in that position to begin with. Mm -hmm. And so for myself, um, so when I, when I talk to my kids now, it's a matter of you, you put that faith in them early. And so they know that their life is valuable. They know that they have worth. And whatever happens, they can come to you. And if that did happen to one of my kids, I would say, great, let's raise the baby together. But when you come from a broken family, unfortunately, that yeah. that doesn't have that faith, all those things just, I mean, it's like the floodgates just open. Yeah, the moral culpability, I think that's really a, a good point, that it's greatly limited by the force of, of evil that's, that's around a person. You know, and we were right. talking and, and about that too, about how it just emotionally, psychologically, there can be just a shutdown. And it's and true, the, like, the like you is, had said, yeah. when, you, mm -hmm. um, when you just go and say, okay, well, I'll just go and do the abortion, and then there's a whole cascade. Yeah. Because now there's, 
there's other things that the devil will go into your mind and all of a sudden you're labeled as like this this murderer or a baby killer like there's yeah. there's all these things that that will go along that you're being labeled and like I tell my kids I said look at the end of the day mm -hmm. society can label you as whatever you want but it only matters what God thinks and and when you carry that shame it's hard because you feel like and the devil speaks to that because they go see you're a bad person you can't go back into church because God won't because you killed, you know, you, you took a life, so you can't go. So it has a self, you know, sure. perpetuating thing. But on the, on the good news side is that you learn from that. You come back. God forgives you. You forgive yourself. And then you're able to teach your children. And thereafter, like my kids know about the rights and wrong. They know about the church. They, and so it's, it's the brokenness. Unfortunately, it doesn't matter if it's, it doesn't matter what society dictates at the end of the day, it's, it's still between you and God. So it's not any different than, than going out and just murdering somebody off the street. A life is a life and it's not ours to take. Thank you, Stacey. You're Thank you for that. We'll take one more question and we'll go into our Lexio. Yeah, oh, there's like three other people. <laughs> and, I, and I'll be available afterwards for more questions too, I'll, out by the uh, patio. Father, I'm, I'm concerned about a child. They said that is born, that they're born in darkness. And I worry or I think about how many children in this world are born and not baptized. And it just seems so unfair. I mean, it, it's, it doesn't seem, it seems so unfair to me that a child would have to suffer that mm -hmm. because I mean, what could, we, what could be done to make this better known to people? Because I was like, yeah. you know, when I read it, I was like in awe. I never even thought about that because, you know, I'm mm. growing up. You're talking up about the it. child being born, babies are born into darkness, right? Yes, yeah. and they're not baptized. You know, the parents Yeah, Father don't. Ricardo didn't, didn't pull punches on that part, did he? Yeah, that's yeah. really, I mean, that, to me, that just seems so yeah. incredibly cruel. It's been the tradition, the, che the teaching of the church for centuries. Uh, we just don't we don't say it very often. Then we, um, we need to. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just I don't know. It's just because I know I was born in a family where I mean I wasn't even a month old and I was baptized. Yeah. But I, I think about how unfair it is to. Um, so what, yeah, what we're referring to is there. There's a part of the book where Father Ricardo talks about how ba when babies are born into the world, they're born in the state of original sin, right? And they they're born with that state in which they are under the dominion of Satan. So that's, that's, what he's, that's what he was referring to, and that's why they need baptism, because baptism cleanses us of original sin and any actual sins we may have been committed and bring, may have committed, and then brings us into sanctifying grace, which means saving grace, that uh, connect, brings us into the life of the church and united with Jesus Christ, and it happens through baptism, right? Um, something that we want to always keep in mind is God's justice and mercy in the end. Uh, so he... He does transcend the ordinary means that he establishes for salvation. So we can always just keep that in mind. Um, so if a baby is born into the world at one month and the parents, for, for whatever reason, didn't get the baby baptized at that, at that point, you know, where does, the, where does the baby go? Well, we believe in God's mercy and justice and that, and that he would take that into consideration when talking about the culpability of the child who is completely innocent. Yeah. So. Stillborn, yeah, like stillborn cases, just like that, yeah. Now, they, and they talk about different kinds of baptisms, and this is like a whole other series, but, you know, baptism of desire, baptize, actual baptism by sacrament, baptism by desire, baptism by blood. Um, you know, that the parents desi the desire to have their baby baptized, right, but the baby passes away before, for whatever reason, can be baptized, that the child has received the graces of, the, of that baptism. Baptism by blood is when one desires to be baptized, uh, but they're martyred beforehand, which, which should count for something, you know? Uh, so there's a baptism there, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but no, but it, it is urgent, though, that, that children be baptized. That is nevertheless true, yeah. And, and I like your question, you know, about how unfair it is for a child to be born in darkness. In other words, not just be born in darkness, 
in this world, but also perhaps being born into a family that, that is not a family of faith, you know. But the same can be said of all of us. We're all were born into original sin. And who's responsible for that, right? Well, Adam and Eve and our parents as well weren't, weren't perfect, you know. God is really uh, interesting. He's an interesting God, isn't he? Um, that he places a profound responsibility in, in our hands, each and every single one of us, you know, as, as parents, as a priest, right? As people that, in, that have influence on other people, you know, your friends, your family. It's really profound. What he, what, and he doesn't take back that responsibility. He takes it very seriously. Yeah. Hence the need for prayer. Good. All right, let's go ahead and enter into our Lexio, and I'll be around uh, by the wall, by the mural. We're going to be by the mural. It's nice and cool outside. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to, to uh, talk to you out there afterwards. And next week I will talk about, we'll reflect on Captured by the World, and I'll be drawing from one of Bishop Robert Barron's presentations when he talks about the influences of the world. And, and then after that, then we'll get into the good news. So one more bad news session, and then we'll get into the good news for it, and then we'll, we'll launch into heaven from there. Okay. Let's open up our minds and our hearts now to the movements of the Holy Spirit. Let's ask him in our own words to prepare us to hear his voice in our hearts through the reading of this sacred scripture. A reading from Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any other wild creature that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat of any of the tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now the serpent was more subtle than any other wild creature that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say, You shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, 
But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now let us ask the Lord in our own words to reveal to us if there's any kind of resolution to be made, any kind of way to take action in our lives following from anything we may have received in this reading. Let's ask for his energy and enthusiasm to do his will. Now let us end by offering up, as we have been doing, one decade of the rosary. And let us contemplate the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the fourth glorious mystery. I invite you to kneel or remain seated. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now, at the hour of our death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. 
Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. O oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, lead all souls into heaven, especially those in most need of thy mercy. Let's also pray the St. Michael prayer together. St. Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickednesses and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the heavenly host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl throughout the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Our Lady of Sorrows, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll see you next Wednesday, or this Wednesday at 7, and see you outside right now. If you want to join us, we'll have refreshments and food and everything by the mural. Thank you for being here tonight.